Hey everybody, this is my uh, talk about Bird Box and the contemporary place of rhetoric. But I just want to say I really apologize for botching the Greek. I'm much better at pronouncing ancient Greek than that, but I don't know what it was. Maybe I didn't have enough water. Maybe I didn't have enough alcohol or hardcore drugs to pronounce it correctly. But um, I do put it up on the screen so you can pronounce it correctly to yourself. But uh, otherwise, uh, here is the talk I gave at St. John's in February 2019 on the movie Bird Box and what it can tell us about the rhetorical. Okay, so thanks for coming everybody. It's a busy day. Uh, the recent Netflix film Bird Box purports to be a thriller in the popular style of post-apocalyptic survival horror film. These films are so frequent and made in such variety that one has to wonder if creatures that are so creative in imagining the myriad ways that civilization can come to an end, that if we could actually think up solutions to the life-ending threats that face us in reality. Bird Box seems an unlikely candidate to provide such support, seeing as the film is about otherworldly forces that alter human life forever by their mere appearance. These beings move humans to suicide as quickly as possible just by showing up. Within no time, humanity is reduced to small groups living in darkness and blindfolding themselves in order to go outside to get supplies. I guess I, before I talk, I should put this up if you haven't seen the movie. No, um, Got to be I fair. Um, within no time, humanity is reduced to small groups living in darkness and blindfolding themselves in order to go outside to get supplies. It is a wonderful irony that our dream of unobstructed, perfect sight and perfect knowledge would yield the apocalypse. Once we see these beings, there's nothing to say. Discourse is over, and so is existence. We submit to the light in a very literal way. It seems obvious that Bird Box is about um, debilitating odds. It would also be read to be about the power of sight, how we use it, and how it sees us. But I will offer a reading of the film as about our apprehension of apprehension. It is a great irony of people that our only ways to interact with the world are hopelessly flawed. On our best days, with our best acumen, we will still get it wrong. Wouldn't it be nice to find a way to have perfect sight, perfect information, perfect knowledge? Bird Box, Bird Box answers these questions with a resounding no. It is better to grope around in the dark. It is better not to see. It is better to live in the world of interpretation only, the rhetorical world. Bird Box can be read as a defense of rhetorical ways of knowing in comparison to totalizing absolute facts. This means rhetoric is at home in a post-fact world, which is the world of Bird Box. Rhetoric has always been in competition with perspectives in the world that present themselves as absolute, objective, and real. And rhetoric has always pushed against that effacing uh, domination of such claims, preferring instead to move about in the shadows for the freedom and autonomy that interpretation of shifting in shadows brings. I do not mean that there is a singular or only one or best way to interpret contemporary rhetoric and where it happens to be. The lesson of Bird Box as an allegory for rhetorical theory is the exact opposite lesson, that a world of rich interpretation is superior to the erasure of human activity by the light of truth. Ironically, Bird Box is a film that is about the dangers of universal meaning. To see, to apprehend, to know conclusively what is out there is the monster in Bird Box. To be in the dark, to grope, and to move based on your best assembled guest is to survive, to have human life. The place of contemporary rhetoric is to remain in the darkness and to make do in the shadows, for this is the place of human creativity and human freedom. To understand this interpretation, we must return to the ancient conflict between Plato and the sophists in Athens. Plato believed the sophists to be tricksters skilled in the art of making things sound good in opposition to philosophy, which is the quest for the truth. In his dialogue Republic, Plato has Socrates narrate the famous allegory of the cave. In this story, Socrates tells us to imagine most of human life to be forced to look at shadows, mistaking them for reality. The shadows move along the wall that we are bound to face, and we cannot turn behind us to see the source. These shadows are cast by objects that pass between a fire and the wall. The people in the cave have no idea they are being manipulated. They assume that they see reality as it is. If someone escaped from the cave, Socrates says, they would be immediately blinded by the light of the sun. But after some time, they would adjust and see that the blinding light of the sun illuminates all things, allowing the escapee to see most clearly. They would be excited and return to the cave to convince others to also escape. But, Socrates says, this person would be seen as crazy, rejecting the shadows which are to be understood as real by the cave dwellers. They would fight as they were dragged out of the cave, blinded and uncomfortable in their new world. But no matter what, they must be liberated. This sounds very attractive considering our contemporary political situation. 
And it's a nice allegory for philosophers. The how and the why that the first person gets out of the cave to see things as they truly are is the process of philosophy as a whole. And today it's not hard to see the attraction of getting away from the shadows of fake news and alternative facts. Life in the post-fact world feels like we're in the world of shadows. Finding this process and teaching it to everyone, no matter how strongly they protest, seems like a good thing. But from the sophistic perspective, this is truly a horror movie. Things are pretty great in the world of the cave. Ripped from the world of forms, interpretation, and argument about what things are, the light of the sun eliminates not only discourse, but their whole existence. The philosopher destroys the world. Republic is a post-apocalyptic tale, like Bird Box, where interpretation has been replaced by a type of blindness, the blindness of perfect sight. After all, why have sight, discussion, thought, interpretation, if apprehension alone reveals the true light of the truth? Bird Box is an allegory for rhetoric in the way that Plato provides an allegory for philosophy. The cave story is retold as a horror thriller for sophists, the terror of bright light and the eradication of disputation and disagreement as the cornerstone of society. Truth beyond interpretation that must simply be apprehended effacing your identity in its light is the stuff of sophistic nightmares. This read is further reinforced when we meet the main character, Mallory, who is a painter. Obviously, someone this invested in sight is the perfect protagonist for a world where sight is fatal. But painting is also one of the arts banned from Plato's Republic. Painters, poets, and rhetoricians are banned from the perfect state because they deliberately confuse appearance for reality as their profession. They give us images of non-existent things, places, things, people that are not there, happy little trees, all this kind of like stuff, and they cause us to revel in the illusion. When Plato says that representational, representational poetry, and this is a direct translation from Republic, deforms minds, he means this quite literally. There's no, this isn't some kind of abstract critique. Uh, he really does mean this stuff is, um, is harmful. And uh, I'm out of the camera here. There we go. Um, and uh, that's backed up by Robin uh, Waterfield in her translation, 1996 translation of Republic. During this first scene, Mallory exchanges several interpretations of the picture of reality that is being painted for us on the news, through relationships, things with her sister. They, agree, they disagree on types of breeds of horses and types of partners and their superiority. And they have different interpretations of Mallory's pregnancy and the breakup that she's had with the uh, father of the child. After Mallory's doctor's appointment, the sisters realize the terror has arrived in their town. Jessica sees the being and very quickly shows herself out, which I think is the right way to talk about what they do to themselves, as do most of the population. Mallory is saved in the street by Tom, who takes her into a house where few survivors have gathered to react in horror as to what has happened. As some of the characters, such as the shady Felix, offer marijuana and wait for the inevitable, other characters, such as police officer Lucy and veteran Tom, express certainty that authorities will arrive to save them and they will be rescued. Gregory and Douglas, as strange neighbors, mourn the loss of their partners, who they watched commit suicide moments ago, right in front of their house. The world of Bird Box is the world of uninterpretable apprehension. The creatures defy interpretation to the point where human beings no longer want to exist. There's no debate, there's no dialogue, there's only a stark reality being before them. Here inside this house, we are offered a cross-section of the cave as a miniaturized America, trapped in the shadows, unable to see what's going on outside for fear of death. They only have one another as a source of knowledge. Far from the superior platonic episteme, the survivors rely only on doxa, the knowledge of the people, an attempt to build a functioning society within the cave. They struggle over authority, appropriateness, and resource needs. This scene here, where it shows all of them as like kind of a nice, everybody in America is represented in this. Like there's the veteran, the African-American guy, the veteran, the drug dealer, the cop, the senior citizen, the pregnant single mom, and then when Olympia comes, the married, hmm? Crazy wife. Yeah, the drug dealer, dealer guy, and also Felix. Douglas. And then Douglas, who's like the um, build a wall, make America great again, Trump guy. Um, so this scene is Kenneth Burke's description of rhetoric's place. Humans huddled together, nervously loquacious on the edge of an abyss. Loquacious indeed, they all have something to express, and in doing so give our allegory some relief. This is not a simple binary of interpretation versus objective reality. This is an allegory about rhetorical interpretation, that is, an interpretation that is not connected to an external rubric of validation. What counts as knowledge in the cave is a quite a different beast than what the account of, of knowledge that philosophy gives us is. The first example to kind of show this kind of rhetorical interpretation in the contemporary I'll show is the relationship between neighbors Gregory and Douglas. This is, if you haven't seen the movie, this is Gregory, this is Douglas. 
Um, and they're neighbors, and they're kind of estranged neighbors. They're fighting. Early on, we learn that Douglas was in the process of suing Gregory and his husband before the apocalypse happened. We are led to believe, via Douglas's conservative utterances, that he might be homophobic. When Gregory makes the ultimate sacrifice for the group, sacrificing himself to get a better look at these creatures to see what they're up against, Douglas makes sure to mention uh, to him before this happens that the lawsuit was not about that. Gregory confidently says, I know, and laughs in reply. Mallory then later asks Douglas why he's suing his neighbor Gregory, and Douglas reveals that it's because Gregory and his partner were adding an atrium onto their house. And when she follows up asking him why that mattered to him, why it was any of his business, as quote, I would have had to look at it every day. There are limits to a sight as an evaluative rubric in this story. The appearance through the the appearance through appearance would lead anyone to come to the same conclusion is a trap. But in the darkness, Douglas's argument rings hollow. There must be better reasons, grounded perhaps in situations that govern conflicts. In the film, Douglas sacrifices himself while firing blind to break the people in the house from Gary, a not too subtle critique of Douglas's political position. Shooting blindly to protect the children, I think sums up his uh, politics pretty well. The second story is the character of Charlie. He works at the local grocery store, he writes science fiction books and hopes to be published, but it's quickly revealed that he has, has very little experiences outside of um, his very quiet, alone life. As someone who works purely in interpretation, he writes stories but does not engage in experiences. He engages the type of poesis that Plato despises, pure creation. But when the stakes could be any higher, Charlie sacrifices himself to save the group, ending his story. Interpretation without grounding in reality is often mocked as the root of danger in other places other than the Republic. But here we find the poet acting heroic, off script, acting in a self-sacrificial way that nobody could have predicted. His actions save the group and are not based on any life experiences or training that Charlie had had. There's also the character of Olympia who comes into the house later and is Mallory's nightmare or mirror interpretation of what it means to be a pregnant woman. Olympia has a traditional view of pregnancy. She nervously talks about her husband, their life together, potential names. Mallory seems to ignore her pregnancy and pushes it out of her mind at every opportunity. She doesn't want to speak about it. One would expect these competing interpretations about what it means to be pregnant that would lead to conflict. Instead, the women become close, close enough that when Olympia sees the creature, she's able to perform one last action, handing her newly born child to Mallory before defenestrating herself. Olympia and Mallory's relationship gives us pause as the world grounded by apprehension, one view would have to be right. Here, incommensurability is the root of forging friendship in the cave. Finally, there are the birds from which the movie's named. Mallory discovers them chirping in the supermarket, tells them they don't know how lucky they are. Quite right. Birds communicate through birdsong and chirping, but they do not have the capacity of rhetoric, as Kenneth Burke argues in his famous comparison. When birds make a warning sign, they flee whether there's danger or not. There is no interpretation for birds, according to Burke. When birds, uh, they are immune from the creature since they cannot have their existence threatened by the elimination of interpretation. Burke writes about an imaginary um, flock of birds that has to give up their uh, poetic signs for danger and food and rely on more definitive signs as they diversified. It's sort of like talking about people. They gave up their interpretation in favor of definition for precision of meaning to where they could no longer interpret signs based on context. The birds are interpreted in many different ways by human beings, most notably as a warning. The canary in the coal mine flipped over. They make a lot more noise when we're in danger instead of going silent. They're also seen as uh, lucky and the possibility of interpreting them as standing in for the fragility, risk, and limitations of Mallory and the children also come to mind. The birds' chirps and their presence are invitations for interpretation and reaction. Birds, for Kenneth Burke's interpretation, are the symbols of the forgotten poets who invoke general signs for interpretation as opposed to the obsessive, definition-oriented world of apparent technical speech. Um, also, I couldn't really find a good source for this, but I do believe that um, Gorgias and some of the other sophists performed Aristophanes the birds as a way to attract students in ancient Athens, but I'm not quite sure whether that's a story that somebody told or whether there's documentation for this. But it is, the timeline works out, but it's possible. Um, these situations within the cave, after the light has been revealed, indicate how interpretation could create reality in different iterations. Interpretation, or fumbling about in the darkness to find meaning, as we might call it, what's going on in the house, is not inferior to shedding light, but an alternative to shedding light. 
It is not revelatory and totalizing, it is creative and contextual. It is the crafting of a meaningful state of affairs out of virtually nothing. Interpretation has limits, but those limits call on us to account for ourselves in the dark place. The contemporary place of rhetoric is accounting for our positions, not hoping that exposure to them will convert others. In Plato's dialogue, The Sophist, the enigmatic stranger, not Socrates, describes debating the Sophist in this way in Christopher Tinsdale's translation. The Sophist runs away into the darkness of that which is not, which he has had practice dealing with, and he is hard to see because the place is so dark. Master of the Dark Arts is apparently not a title limited to Harry Potter books. The Sophists, in Plato's estimation, damage people by studying, creating meaning in and about, and literally maintaining dark spaces like the house. Apprehension of meaning and the visual is under-theorized in my presentation so far. To make this richer, I'll turn to the work of John Berger, whose Ways of Seeing, a popular 1970s BBC show, and his print book of the same name, argued that we are taught by ideology how to see, that nothing is apparent without the hard work of the invisible editors of ideology. For Berger, the question of interpretation loomed large, especially in the judgment of art, where the question of why some things are made a painting and some not haunted him. Berger believed that refined training in how to look, how to see, and how to know became flattened into a process deemed as natural. Without unpacking, the look can carry with it a number of political interpretations that would be lost on those who do not do this critical work. Such a danger reveals a need for pedagogical theorizing in how we look, a reference that I take to mean the Ciceronian canon of rhetorical style, or as Burke put it, what goes with what. Taught and learned, reinforced by power, they are at their best when they are undetected or synonymous with nature. Such compact approaches to seeing and knowing should be disrupted and judged. That's also why we stare at masterworks of art from 400 years ago and say, I don't really get it. The sophistic darkness of interpretation requires each step to be explained. Seeing is also the art of explaining. It has no obvious superiority over interpretation. They're competing modes of knowledge. Here's John Berger's um, quote, a large part of seeing depends upon habit and convention. The contemporary place of rhetoric in creating what we see in the darkness, not eliminating the darkness. There are great problems with clarity as the solution to disagreement. Uncertainty and lack of clarity, the inability of the facts to pierce the mind of our opponents, suggests clarification as a rhetorical strategy of desperation, not of advancement. Consider the work of the so-called Gaza School of Rhetoric, working in the late Roman Empire. Gaza was a city of crossroads. Everyone came there hoping to make it either in or under the benefits of Roman law. Coricus of Gaza and other sophists taught rhetoric to those hoping to work in the nascent Christian church or the Roman courts. His pedagogy he described as epistike... I, I mispronounced that. It's epistike... Strizine, epistrizine, I think is how you say it. Uh, or darkening is how you translate it. Quintilian cites Livy as a source and tells us that many a rhetoric teacher told his students to wrote with clarity to darken it. Estison. Echo tison. Echo tison. So darken it, echo tison, or the strategy of darkness, which is uh, epistrizine. It is important for the rhetor then, as it is now, to be comfortable in the use, interpretation, and the creation of shadows where others would, see, would shine light. Corticus understands that within uncertainty and within a shadowy position, there is great possibility for the flexibility of claim. We must be curators of the darkness, not exterminators of the places of possible meaning. Shadows are also an important part of the film Bird Box. Mallory uses the shadows to determine when it is safe to move as she goes out foraging. The shadows of the forest at the end of the film cause her and the children to stumble and fall. As the shadow created by the blanket in the refuge, the meeting place, where they determine how to handle contingencies when on the boat. Douglas comments to Mallory that her father seems like an overshadowing and imposing figure, and the shadows in the scene where Tom and Mallory argue about what stories are appropriate for the children also suggest this importance. Darkness, uncertainty, unclarity, the need to turn the head, to squint, to hear again, all of these are not problems for rhetoric. These are, the re these are the rhetoric's places, the conditions of its being. These are the moments of human invention, the creation of explanations, and the crafting of symbols and procedures to handle them. For the sophist and the contemporary place of rhetoric, it is an impoverished theory to suggest that interpretation is secondary to facts, or interpretation is just bickering until the truth is revealed. Even more importantly, interpretation is not in a binary contest that ends when one interpretation is ruled true. The darkness is the place where the sophist Protagoras claimed he could make the weaker case the stronger, and where Gorgias could praise Helen in a room full of Athenians, and they would applaud him. 
It is no mistake that in bird box, shadows are frequent, often suggesting danger, but really just a sense of uncertainty. Is that shadow a person, a liberator, or a monster? Perhaps it's just the wind or a tree in the sun. This is the temptation to erase all doubt by looking. The doubt for rhetoric is a place of necessity for the creation of arguments and possibilities. Now, Olympia was led into the house later through a process that Tom created on the fly when she knocked on the door. Such a process was transparent, step by step, and worked to the benefit of all as they had a strong idea who was behind the door. Olympia, hoping to do a similar good deed, permits Gary to enter the house. Although I have had experience with the supermarket with Charlie, it had not registered to them that there were people who could see fine in the light, and they were out there, and they had no trouble handling what they saw. The philosopher is about to liberate the cave. The character of Gary tells a story to gain sympathy to enter the cave by, of people who force others to look. Claiming that it is beautiful, liberating, freeing to look, the converted work to remove the blindfolds and open eyes by force if needed. They are the high priests of absolute beauty, seeking to convert all the holdouts in the cave to the world of non-interpretation of absolute undeniable beauty. They have no concern in the least that there might not be a place for many under this regime of totalizing truth. They are helping people, eliminating pathetic ways of thinking. They will drag everyone out of the cave. Gary is no exception. He reveals to the audience, while the house is engaged with unexpected dual childbirth, that he has been drawing the creatures. But he is not satisfied. Nothing is as good as seeing them for yourself, of getting out of the cave. These are just shadows after all. He then shows Douglas, who has been locked in the garage due to his threats of Gary, that he is silencing the birds. Interpretation in the darkness is no longer needed. We do not need the flapping of wings. All evaluation has been eliminated. He then begins to bring light into the cave with much joy. After all, he's doing something good for everyone. They will greet him as a liberator. I don't think we've heard that phrase before. The character of Gary as the philosopher returning the cave and non-consensually dragging people into the light brings to mind what passes as public intellectuals these days. Steeped in the discourse of scientism, figures like Gary do not recognize science as a discourse. Science is the end of discourse, the end of dispute and debate. Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson, pictured here, advocates that science and scientific reasoning will solve all political matters by facing them. We can know, so stop arguing. There are some that are simply not important. So there are some questions, though, that are simply not important, so they do not fit scientific approaches. Bill Nye, also pictured here, attempted to drag creationists out of their cave by showing them shale and limestone that was right under the feet of the Kentucky audience in a debate, blaming them for holding back intellectual development. On YouTube, Bill Nye tells a questioner that majoring in the humanities is not the future, that these fields are inexact and there are better ways to know. These approaches are indeed the approaches of those blinded by the light, but in awe of the experience, hoping to give others the same feeling. Being right is more about the pleasure of rightness rather than doing good for other people. Gary sincerely believes that he's doing good, and the protesting of the members of the house to be evidence that they need to look to get better. Once they see, they'll be fine. They'll be the ceasing of protesting. It's just simply a non sequitur in relation to acceptance. They do not have a choice when it comes to the creatures. Acceptance is all there is, totalizing final and beautiful. After Gary liberates almost everyone in the cave, killing them all except for Tom, who manages to kill him, Mallory and the children escape and spend years on the move, going from house to house for supplies and shelter. They always have a threat of the creatures and the philosophers, but reliance on process instead of result is what keeps them alive. Rhetoric's place in the contemporaries in the process, the iteration and reiteration, not aimed necessarily at a result. The particulars are the stuff of clear visuality. A world without human beings is the world without interpretation, but there is a refuge. After Tom and Mallory spend years on the run they, run, they find a CB radio, and one day Rick appears on the radio and announces to them that there's a community down the river several miles. Rick warns that there's a stretch of the river that is dangerous with rapids and that someone will, in his words, have to look. Tom and Mallory argue about making the dangerous trip in the river as the proselytizers and philosophers grow closer to their position every day. They also have a significant fight about the children. Mallory refuses to name them, she calls them boy and girl, and refuses to let Tom tell them hopeful stories of imagery they will never see. Tom believes these narratives are vital for life and to instill in them a sense of hope and love. Mallory is fearful of interpretation to slide into the normative, whereas Tom is unconcerned with this. For him, the normative is not an issue because it doesn't exist without articulation. For Mallory, keeping the children safe requires a strict adherence to pragmatic authority, whereas Tom believes that stories, narratives, and images are just as important. 
The contrast comes to a head in this great scene, probably my favorite scene in the whole movie, where on a supply run they discover a box of strawberry Pop-Tarts and gather the children around to experience it. This is what strawberry tastes like, they tell the children. There is a moment of happiness, but it is quickly interrupted by the arrival of the philosophers who announce they are coming in to liberate the residents of the house. Tom tells Mallory to take the children out back and that he will deal with the liberators. This moment of the Pop-Tarts, one of the most simulated and false and corporate foods imaginable. I, I doubt there's one strawberry made in the process of Pop-Tarts. I don't know. I didn't look at the ingredients. I love them. <coughs> it conveys a nice contrast of what knowledge generated sophistically and rhetorically looks like compared to knowledge that comes from the external objective world. The Pop-Tart scene shows how even a poorly articulated simulation of a strawberry can create a moment of teaching, a traditional goal of rhetoric. Outside, though, as they flee, Tom confronts the liberators who are polite, claiming they can help him step into the light. He just needs to remove his blindfold. They call him friend. They try to persuade him. After the children are discovered, though, they chase after the children to get them, and Tom quickly tosses his blindfold and dispatches them quickly with a rifle. But in doing so, he succumbs to the light. Burke's take on rhetoric being a selection and therefore a deflection of reality indicates that interpretation is not solipsistic. On the contrary, one becomes painfully aware of the mischances that holding onto an interpretation might yield. What is solipsistic is the totalizing vision of the liberators, the fantasy of pure and absolute fact. Under that light, Tom can barely kill the last liberator before he shows himself out. The place of rhetoric is to stop positing interpretation as opposed to truth. Interpretation as a way of knowing based on legitimate inferences about context is combined with the creativity of making shapes out of shadows. Under the regime of apprehended truth, the totalizing light makes such oppositions irrelevant anyway, like who could build a, a community around Pop-Tarts, right? Like, but they managed to do this, have this wonderful me moment of meaning in the darkness. Tom was tempted by the, uh, by, um, the timetable and by fear, and he was tempted and succumbed. He uh, gave in to the absolute information of vision and paid the price. Could he have saved them without succumbing to the temptation of absolute fact? Mallory will soon be tempted the way um, Tom was because now she must make the river run alone. She heeds Rick's warning about the rapids and explains to the children, there's the rapid scene. She explains to the children in their refuge meeting place, she creates, literally creates a shadow so she can have her discourse in the shadows and then tells them that one of them must look. She sits there quietly and tries to maintain her solidly pragmatic presence that without looking there's no chance. But after confronting Olympia's child who bravely volunteers to do it, she realizes that there's no chance of any of them preserving the value that they have in the shadows if one of them looks. So then Mallory concludes, nobody will look. Although seeing the rocks in the rapids might make their navigation more probable, Mallory finally understands that even given the light of apprehension, nothing is certain. Seeing and interpretation are placed on the same level, and she is unwilling to sacrifice the value gained in the darkness. The boat crashes and the children are separated from Mallory in the woods and they go through this long scene where navigation becomes incredibly difficult. Without the clarity of the light, they must feel their way through the trees. The creatures work to deceive them, but Mallory keeps her faith and feeling in a way, even trying to persuade the creatures several times to leave them alone. We might not want to go as far as Zen Buddhism in this scene where they're walking around the woods uh, blind, but Zen Buddhism seems to cultivate and celebrate don't know mind. But we also might not want to go to the other end of the extreme, which is a regime of facts where the arbiters of scientism and journalism hide their motives under the guise of authenticity. There is no other way to navigate this but to look. There's Rapid Z, you have to look. You have to look at what we're presenting you. Mallory does eventually find Rick's settlement and is allowed inside. Rick, it turns out, is a teacher at a school for the blind. Used to the darkness, familiar with the dark to the point of no choice, the blind instructor now becomes the leader of the new order of those who are learning how to live in the darkness full time. The film ends with Mallory looking up at the atrium of birds after naming the children. Uh, and maybe we should take this as comfort with the return of the ability to see. At the end of the film, Mallory has become a Burkean. She interprets the same bird calls as a sign that her fight is over and the future, for the lack of a better term, is bright. She is safe in the school of rhetoric where the blind will lead the blind in forging community together on interpretation. Rick and the forest scene indicate to us that a life built around careful interpretation based on context is not solipsism or rejection of better information. The school of the blind, like a school of rhetoric, taught for centuries showed people how to navigate the unknown and to help others navigate the unknown. I can think of no better metaphor than a school of the blind for like teaching rhetoric. 
We see Rick effortlessly move through the new school without assistance. Such training is not only essential for life, but the start of a new political order. So what are we left with? Groping about in the dark is a struggle and a dangerous one. But is looking any better? Our contemporary political situation, oh, this is the end of the film. Our contemporary political uh, situation seems to determine itself purely on the visual, purely on apparent facts. Expose and exposure is all one needs. The politics of so-called resistance rely on apprehension as a one-stop solution to the complex problems of persuasion and knowledge. The belief that people can just see or that exposure will just fix things is the idea of abandoning the cave. This idea only becomes present in the idea of abandoning the cave. Threatening those who do not see or who prefer interpretation or desire to eradicate the cave is not a superior form of knowing, but a way of flattening human experience only to serve a conception of truth. But it isn't a conception. Discourses of the left and discourses of scientism share the idea that discourse should come to an end and succumb to the facts, and the right wing too, I would say. I think that's much more obvious. In Bird Box, the absolute knowledge of expo expose was a sad one as Mallory's sister displayed before she walked in front of the truck. In fact, Mallory says, she looked sad, she never looks sad. And that was her way of remembering her sister. The elimination of humanity from politics and knowledge has been a long-held goal, a quest for purity. But we wonder what that space of pure apparent fact would give us in a term for freedom. The contemporary place of rhetoric is to maintain, curate, and explore the darkness, crafting persuasive moments from it, and quite literally, crafting the darkness as they do when they put the blanket up so they can talk. Um, clarity is not only too simple, it is a dangerous tool for persuasion, for politics, and it encourages a poverty of contextual explanation and orientation. Rhetoric is also the art that posits interpretation against itself, not against modalities of truth on a proximate scale. That is, interpretation creates its own knowledge, its own ways of seeing. The difference is that these ways must be transparent, they must be articulated, and there's no way to see for us to see one another's point. The knowledge of principle and scope, the like, a Pop-Tart rhetoric, if you will, requires no self-sacrifice or succumbing to a greater being in order to participate in knowing. Proximity to experience and community is a source of knowing, and darkening is an art that helps us not see, but understand, create, and live together. Rhetoric's place is at home in the post-fact world. There you go. Wow, all right. So I think we can like actually- have Now we can have like a conversation. We can have a conversation. Yeah. You like it? Nicely, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. You know, I was thinking um, that uh, I think Rumi has talked about this, and some uh, in, uh, also in the context of religion, and that how seeing, because it's connected to our perception, and this leads our lives in a way, seeing, or living for that matter, living in this bright, light, bright world, uh, is a distraction mm. to the human, human being to be connected to the soul, to the real, the core, mm -hmm. which is why when they say somebody dies and leaves this bright world, the seeing world, then they know the truth. They, they are nothing but consciousness. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting. I think Aristotle so, says something like that too, just to combine sort of the roomy with Ar Aristotle says something about the preference of the visual. I don't remember the actual quote, but how yeah. we prefer the visual in some way in his, in his estimation. And that, that's um, neither good nor bad in Aristotle's view, but something we must be aware of. Yeah. Um, but also I like, I like this idea of us um, preferring the, uh, the visual in some weird way or that somehow it's gonna give us um, better senses than our other senses. Um, which is why I like the School for the Blind is the way the movie ends. It's kind of funny when you realize that the mastermind of saving humanity is this blind man. Mm -hmm. He just lives at the blind, he just runs up School for the Blind and it's like, you know, that's where everybody lives now. Um, I think though also Kenneth Burke talks about birds in terms of interpretation and how if the birds, he has this, these weird 
uh, metaphors that just go on to the point of ridiculousness. So he's like, let's say the birds, like, they flap and they squawk and it means food over here, roost over here, danger over here. But what if some of them wanted to live on the ground and some wanted to live on the trees? And then what if they developed a language? Mm -hmm. And then now you can't squawk in the same way because danger from the air is different than danger. So they would find a false sense of security in a technical specialized language for danger, food, shelter. But what they would lose is the more open interpretive frame of like burdenness, right? So this is like Burke's concern that we're replacing communication with a technocratic order rather than an interpretive order. So that's why he says poets are so important because our words are weighted down with technical efficiency, but poets give our weighted words wings. That's the phrase he uses just to play with it. The poets give our weighted words wings. But no matter cool. what language we use, mm -hmm. whether it's poetry or stories or whatever, or scientific, mm -hmm. it is still subjective. That's right. There is no absolute truth. Mm -hmm. uh, even science collects, you know. But that's just such a sure compelling fantasy, though, yeah, it is. that we could somehow eliminate all of our sensory failings mm -hmm. from. But I mean, would we have such a great? scientific literature if we eliminated humanity. Oh, of course not, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, especially because we're used to this. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that this, this, this yeah. is an obstacle to growth. Yeah. To the, the growth in terms of knowing the, the, the capacity that the consciousness has, that, that the mind can have, the capacity. Mm -hmm. These are all obstacles because perception creates a, a box for us whether it's scientific or whatever. It's not everything, it is what you see, how you interpret, mm -hmm. interpret it. Yeah, But absolutely. I loved it. it was great, great, great. Thanks. Whoever wants to sing it, you can just talk. You mean first? You mean second? <laughs> Everyone, okay. fight, fight. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready to fight from the start. I'm, yeah. So right. I just uh, waited to see if okay. that was No, no, you're um, fine. Yeah. 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 I have a couple of things uh, to suggest. Okay. I like, I really like the paper. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like the, I mean, I just love the discussion of sophisticated darkness and interpretation as uh, necessary for survival. Yeah. Um, I think that one of the things to keep in mind in, in further iterations of the paper is the relationship between things like power and certainty, mm -hmm. right? Because like in this notion of like, um, I mean, being woke, is being aware of the powers um, and being um, sophistic and being able to interpret things means you have a kind of power that you might not have in the world and in other places, right? Like, um, and on that sort of note, I would say like there's just thinking about metaphors of white and black, mm -hmm. like metaphors of brightness and darkness. Mm -hmm. um, it's literally called the Enlightenment and it's literally called the Dark Ages. And Tony Morrison yeah. wrote that great book about black and white metaphors. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that might be something to keep in mind. Like um, I don't know if you, I don't know. I would, I would, like what I would do is if I were rewriting the paper, I would put the power and the certainty thing early on and discussing because like what you have, you start about apprehension of apprehension. Yep. And um, rhetoric is home in a post fact world, moving about in the shadows. And I think in that discussion, like when you say post fact, like I know you're deliberately being sort of a fire starter, mm -hmm. but I think you could also talk about the notion of like power. Um, how it's easy for us in this room to have this discussion about nothing being um, true mm -hmm. when um, the costs of being shown by the psychiatrist, philosopher, yeah. whatever, all those different words, psychologist, yeah. psychiatrist, philosopher. <laughs> the person who brings the it, light. Is to show yourself out, right? Right. So there's like, so the power is they put you in a place where you are no more. That's right. Because you chose not to be. Mm -hmm. So I think that's like a really, I, I would just, that's one thing I would, I would sort of preface. Yeah. And I do think like with like the sort of like woke politics and other things like that, that it's, it's this sort of, um, Apollo Freer talks about this. Audre Lorde talks about this. Other people yeah. about the, the the tempting danger of inversion. Right, right. So you know, with woke politics, like nobody wants to have a conversation. Like when you ask questions, you're a Nazi. You know, you're you're irredeemable. Right. Mm -hmm. So it literally is on both extremes. The the scientism extreme of Bill Nye and 
and Neil deGrasse Tyson, who are not intellectuals at all. Like you look at someone like Lionel Trilling, that's intellectual work, because work is mostly questions and engagement. These people don't want to engage, they want to, they want to eliminate uh, engagement, which I think symbolically in Bird Box is the elimination of most of the population of the world. Right. By showing themselves out, you no longer have a voice, you no longer have an, an interpretation, you no longer have a human existence. You're just, you know, just um, pushed down by this. So, I mean, the metaphor of woke is really kind of funny in a way because it's like this idea of like liberation to like out of the cave, like right. oh, the, the sleepwalker is finally awake. They can see, they open their eyes, right? all this stuff is there too. But I think this discourse of power, I think Berger gets to that really nicely too. Maybe I could do more with that. I was going to say, yeah, like when we yeah. with the Berger stuff, like the ideology, like you do yeah. a good job of touching on it. I just think that's one of the things that maybe would be, I would, it's just, a, it's, a, it's an open question until you talk about the ideology of seeing. Sure. Um, yeah. And that seems like a thing you could maybe start out with, like, it, like just, I don't know, structure yeah. maybe. So, you, so you're talking about sort of ideological constructions mm -hmm. at the very beginning. And how this is a dystopian story that unlike a lot of dystopian stories, is not really right or left. Right. I mean, you could make it that way, you could play with that, right? But like Orwell, um, uh, Aldous Huxley, mm -hmm. uh, Gibson, like most of them have a particular sort of political meaning, mm -hmm. and they're playing with um, the politics. And you're talking about the politics of sight, which has a scientific meaning. Yeah. I mean, it has a leaning of like this. I mean, it's a fantasy that's happened many times before. Of like, what would happen if we couldn't see anymore, or what would happen if we could see too well? And I think the the paradigmatic one of those, or the oldest one of those in the Western tradition. I'm sure there's other cultural traditions about being able to see too well. Is Cassandra, which I think is a great like she could see the future perfectly. Well, but Pandora too, like she sees everything. Yeah, yeah. Except for yeah, I mean, Cassandra was like, she got that great gift and then yeah. was cursed that right. if she was right about the future, no one would ever believe her persuasive attempts to change it. Right. So she went insane. Um, so that's part of it, too. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's not really right or left. It's more of a question of, of how do those... One of the things the movie's pretty good at is how do those positions alter when everyone's stuck in the same house? Mm -hmm. So let's put America in a house where they can't go outside and see what happens. And then they go shopping together, which I think is really hilarious. That shows a lot <laughs> of like everybody, like that great scene. I didn't go back and watch it to do the scene, but what where every what everyone asks where it is first really says a lot about their motives, right? It's like right. Burkean motives. Yeah, it does. Because like Douglas is like, where's the booze? <laughs> and so <laughs> Tom's like, where are the electronics? Yeah, Tom's, Tom's like, where's the electronics? Media. Where's this? Where's that? He wants to go for communication. Right. He wants to go for like reaching out to others. Right. And then I forget what Lucy asked for, the chips or something. I don't know. They all asked for yeah, something she asked weird. For snacks. Another thing yeah. I would say, like, just interesting, like, playing with the names. Um, Felix is happiness, and he's mm -hmm. the dealer of drugs. Yeah. And Olympia is, like, the goddess, right? Like, mm -hmm. she's, like, this sort of, um, she's, she's sort of ruined by love. Olympia, but it's that image of the mother as well. Right. Like the right. modern goddess. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, she's, like, the perfect mother yeah, stereotype. Yeah. And Mallory's just like, oh god. I mean, like Mary type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I had it yeah. yeah. Speaking of wokeness, there was also a little controversy, I think, with the casting of the characters in my play. Uh, into your paper with power relations. Um, Sandra Bullock being the lead in an older white woman. Um, and then with the relationship with the younger black male mm -hmm. at the end. Yeah, how he's her, yeah. she could be his hot babysitter. He says that to her. Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot there. The but also, like what I have seen in the mainstream, I mean, and it ties back to what you were talking about, and I don't know if this is part of it or not, but there's this idea of the whole like uh, race that is being tackled in there, and like how this I've seen it in, in like really different places talking about how whites do not want to see yeah. race, mm -hmm. as, like it's a an right. imagery, or, you know, like the whole color blindness mm -hmm. type of thing. Right. The color blindness, right. and I think this yeah. is like people have been talking about it at least in the mainstream as as a representation of that of color blindness. Yeah, I mean, there's I this. Know. Um, yeah, there's a there's I something. Mean, a society I that says seeing is believing. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. So I I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's something to play with because it seems like it's. We also have another thing that you can do and contextualize this with other movies that deal with sense deprivation. A Quiet Place comes to mind mm -hmm. really well where... Yeah, I haven't seen that one. 
You have yeah. to move through the world without speaking. Right. You can't be heard at all. It's and how do you survive? Right. And they both came out at the same time, practically, which is interesting. Yeah, a year apart, right? So, I mean, obviously, we're, it would seem to suggest that in society we are have an overabundance of information. Right. And like the post fact thing. Kind of mm -hmm. cut it down. But um, that might just be a way to catch up. Hearing the quiet place might be seen more of a right wing thing. Like if you hear somebody falls, like something. I don't yeah. know, we played that. That could be right. kind of fun to play with. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be cold on the paper. It might right. be interesting to compare and contrast with this one. Yeah, it might be. That one's much more of a, like a horror movie, isn't it? Much more scary. Yeah, the monster is really thrilling? a monster. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it's That's really like literally like there are like shock scares, there are like explosions, yeah. there's like. Um, What's the monster in this? So just a monster is whatever you want it to be. I mean, that's the thing. Like, it's this is one thing I said in here. I was like, um, it's your greatest. They say the greatest fear or your greatest sadness. Yeah, but it's but it's also darkness, no matter what. It, it can be whatever you want it to be. I mean, when they put images of it, metaphorically yeah. darkness. There is nothing. When we that think happens. of like metaphors of darkness, yeah. Yeah. Like or like it's very really tight in that. But there's a dark mist that comes yeah. over the people. And you see the dark. The light of shadow. Yes. Yeah, there's yeah, a shadow. The images that, that he wrote and that he painted or drew, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, she talks about she has darkness of the Yeah. Oh. He's got, yeah, Gary has so many images of the oh, creature. He has so many images right. of the creature, and he's just like incredibly frustrated. None of them are. He has to look again. Mm -hmm. It's just not. So representation is not. You can see. I mean, I think Gary is a really well, nicely motivated guy. Like he would like to just show them the pictures, but he can't because the show. It's like negative theology. You know, if you give God an attribute, you're weakening God. You say God is 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 merciful. You can't say that because the mortal human concept of mercy is way too limiting. Right. You're, you're, it's insulting to God to say that. So negative theology is like you can't make attributions to God. It's a hey, similar kind of thing. the description of the movie? I'm just curious. What do you mean? Oh, you know how the synopsis. synopsis. Oh, I can look that up in a second. I'll but, look it up right yeah, now. The, um, the image of justice, though, is this blind, yeah. the blindfolded woman holding uh -huh. the... It's a really fascinating kind of thing. I thought about putting this in the paper, too, because... This image of justice as being blind and holding thing actually comes from very um, like 19th century, 18th century Italian political cartoon making fun of the failures of the Italian judiciary. Mm -hmm. And we didn't take it as a critique. We took it as proper justice. So, but this is a critique of, of obviously you should have, should, someone should look at the scale. So here's this figure who should look at the scale and determine who's got the better weight of evidence. But the idea of justice being blind is, is saying the justice system fails. But we've taken this as the model of justice. But I think the scales is for the audience to see, right? Yeah. Because if justice equals truth, then they mm -hmm. maybe already knows. The person holding the scales shouldn't say anything about it. Yeah. But I mean, I much prefer the Egyptian, like where Anubis is just really carefully looking at your heart against a feather. Yeah. And I like that image a lot of like this kind of metric. But I mean, this is like, it's just such a funny idea that, um, that this came from like a critique and then became the model. Yeah. Which is really funny. Because um, you see this image everywhere and it's like the bird box advertising imagery looks kind of like, she kind of looks like this justice figure. She does, you know? you're right. Yeah, so I thought about doing something that with that. it. That's creepy. Like they're playing off of this and so she might be like, you could read the movie as like she's a kind of a, a new world justice kind of Just figure. Arbiter. Justice is blind and no one will look. You know, that's like the a big pivotal scene and in the movie. Differences between like mother. Right. Yeah. She's yeah. also a mother. The motherhood thing, the childbirth thing, yeah. the fact that the philosopher opens all the windows when the babies are being born. They're all right. Like, yeah. Everyone's yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. Part of yeah. There's also this aspect of context, right? So, the people who are in the cave, they have the information they need for the cave life. Mm -hmm, yep. It's only deficient if you're stepping outside and then you need different information because the context has changed. Yeah, right? that's right. And then also we always tend to pose it in terms of either or. Yeah, right? that's right. Either we have light or we have darkness. That's right. But there's a whole continuum in between. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I don't know how you would work that into the paper, but it would. Yeah, like, I kind of feel like it's. I kind of feel like it's already in there because 
if you abandon, so normally one of the critiques of interpretation, or even one of the celebrations of interpretation, is that's the process by which we'll arrive at truth. Mm -hmm. So the ex the rubric is externally mounted. So you could have life in the cave, I guess, but it would always be deficient because the interpretations would never be as good as to what's causing the shadows, this kind of thing. But what I think the the place of rhetoric contemporary is is to eliminate that kind of evaluation like we're not it's not a progressive or positivist but all interpretation must be worked out in context so the rubric is situational and, and that might address what you're talking about so there are I mean like Tom he chooses in the situation it's probably better to look and bring in some of that um, you know that absolute knowledge and he guns those people down pretty quick he's a soldier you know he knows what he's doing but then he also like um, keeps the blindfold off too long, I guess. You know, One so it's always a mix. Like, you know, super simplistic, but both of the black guys are poets. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if Tom is a poet. He's a poet. He's a storyteller. He's the one who gives them all the stories about the trees and the birds yep. and whatever. He's the story, he's the yeah. story painter. Mallory is the visual painter, and right. he's, the, he's the verbal painter. Yeah. He's not as much as mm -hmm. a story of, uh, as, the, as Gregory, Charlie. Yeah, um, that's right. But he... They have. I just. That's just like super simple. Like I wouldn't write a paper. And back. she gives her gives up her practice. Yeah. She but doesn't paint anymore. Yeah, but mm -hmm. he still continues. Yeah. Yeah, you could you could see Charlie and Tom as opposites too. So here's a guy who's been in combat and has right. worked with the most foreign people imaginable. He tells that story about walking that guy's kid to school and protecting them every day in Afghanistan when he was a soldier. Um, and he talks about that. So he's had all these great experiences, but um, he's not like trying to create anything necessarily new. He's much more like, well, let's defend him. Yeah. He's a warrior father. Yeah, yeah, he's kind of like. But again, I mean, I think that like when you think about competing interpretations, this idea of a mix, mm -hmm. like the fight they have over what stories are. She is really mad yeah, when she hears him oh, right. telling the story. She's like, you are like filling them with false hope. They're never going to see anything. They're never going to climb a tree. That why are you telling these stories and doing it? He's like, it's important. It's like being a kid. This is important. So for Tom, the normative has no um, finality. But for Mallory, the normative is like a huge problem. Right. Because if this, if they don't realize how um, precarious life in the darkness is, then they're going to die. And so these stories kind of shut that off and it becomes like this question of like, oh, this is what life should be like. So it's okay to take this risk or that one. Tom and Mallory's like, you, no. The strawberry... Uh, Pop-Tart happens after they have that fight. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so it's kind of like a demonstration of like what that knowledge would look like, yeah. or what the what um, investigation would look like in the in the darkness. That that, um, uh, that scene reminded me of a, it's a beautiful life. Like I don't know if you know with the Nazis, with, yeah, with yeah. the kids who were um, oh, yeah. the father and his son in mm -hmm. the Nazi camp, and he like was teaching him how to be a kid, even though they were like in this place that they thought they would never get out of it. Mm -hmm. But they actually made it, I mean, he, he made everything look like a, a fantasy world <coughs> for him. Mm. You know, and I mean, it kind of like, it just jarred that. And that, that's a movie about uh, movies, yeah. right? Like about projection? Is it's that the movie? about stories. No, about oh, stories. Wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Within, I, think I don't know movies very well, so it's like kind of weird that I did this life talk. Life is beautiful. Life is beautiful. I thought it was yeah, like she's she's in the Holocaust. Yeah. 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 yeah, I haven't seen that one. That seems like good to you. So I have a question actually. Yeah. If you like, maybe you can help me with the interpretation because I did not, I did not get this part. Um, the people who were able to see mm -hmm. and it didn't affect them. What is the what was the deal with that? I did not understand. Yeah. So those, how did they get to see without? Nobody knows. Oh, no. But the one thing that you do know about them is almost all of them have had a brush with um, the law. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah, or well, institution. But they, they don't differentiate on or separate the crazy in terms of degrees. I mean, the, uh, my initial take on the film was like, oh, we're just going to straight up look on this thing to death. Like, it's just so right for a Lacanian. It's perfect. But I felt like that was like just a little too easy, you know? Right. Yeah, this question, are they psychotics? Um, they certainly adopt a, a psychotic discourse, um, which is like, if you'll just come over here and just see what I have to show you, 
everything's going to be fine. And normally that means they're going to murder you. So uh, the perfect, yeah, the perfect demonstration of how persuasive and engaging psychotics are is in the movie Patch Adams, mm -hmm. where they're treating that guy for illness. They don't understand he's a psychotic. They're treating him medically. And he's like, to the young uh, female medical resident, he's like, come over to my house. I just, you know, come and talk to me. And, uh, and he's like, yeah, everything's going to be just fine. And he shoots her in the head, right? Because to the psychotic, um, they want order. And that order is usually stillness. They're like, every... It's so for the rest. If you ever look at psychotic discourse, yeah. If you ever look at psychotic discourse, they're like, why are all these corpses moving around? Mm. And they put them down, right? And they're like, um, you're dead. I'm dead. Everybody's dead. Stop talking. Like this kind of thing. So there's that. But then there's also this kind of like weird narcissistic element to it too. Yeah. Like the joy. So Freud talks about the joy of um, scopophilia. The pleasure of looking at something beautiful is irrevocably tied up with the pleasure of being seen looking. So he says that's why um, the peeping Tom's primary concern is not how to look into the house, but if anybody's going to see him. Like that's the primary concern is covering themselves up. And the exhibitionist's primary concern is not how they look, but watching other people watching them. Mm -hmm. So that's like a like hell match. They would never get along, right? <laughs> um, but that kind of relationship of pleasure being bound up, not in the doing of it, but the interpreting of how it's being done is a huge part of it to you. But I also feel like, I don't feel like that's the, I think that the way to look at the movie under that would be that everybody is crazy because I'm going through becoming a mom. So there's this kind of like craziness about motherhood and the discourses of motherhood and everyone telling you how to be, that you could read the movie like that too. Um, with that, like the, the panic and the horror of the mother and the world kind of going away and these other people coming in and telling you how to live and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, the crazy people who can see, they're like, um, they really do feel like they have the truth. That's why I kind of did it this way. Yeah. Because they really yeah. kind of feel, and so I feel like people who feel they have the truth, ironically, don't ever want to discuss it. Mm -hmm. They just want you to accept it. And if you don't accept it, there's something wrong with you, You're either a Nazi or you're a social justice warrior, okay. or you're stupid, yeah. or Community yeah, get out of my face, yeah, get out of my face, you're, <laughs> you're an idiot, um, I hope you don't vote, you know, people kind of like, and people also discredit their humanity, because we're, we have a real, um, we have a real poverty of ways to interact with each other, in terms of argument, and in terms of um, dis political discourse because we don't want to recognize politics as a discourse because that means we have to immediately accept that our best thought is probably wrong yeah. uh, given certain conditions. Our, all our political beliefs are, are absolutely wrong given certain conditions. That's the insight that we get from uh, Protagoras when, he's, when he's asked what's the best form of government. He says, there's not one. If you gave the Spartans democracy, that country would be dead in a week. Like they, they would just collapse. If you tried to, good luck getting the Athenians to live in a military dictatorship, you'd have a revolt on your hands in like hours. Yeah. So democracy is good for Athens and military dictatorship is good for Sparta. And there is no universal form of good government, this kind of thing. Um, and I think that's kind of what he means is that, you know, politics is this like accept, accepting that you're going to be wrong on your best day. And I think that's part of the, the, the um, what gives us fear about elevating interpretation to that level. But the people who are like, cleansed by the light and want to liberate other people, they're not worried about the implications of what happens to the material bodies and the material lives of the people. Gary's very happy when people look and that woman stabs herself to death with the scissors. It's this gruesome scene yeah. where he forces her eyes open and then she grabs the scissors that she's going to stab him with and like stab herself and he's like, yes, yes. He's like very pleased yeah. because his only goal, his goal is not the improvement of people's lives. His goal is the truth, mm -hmm. apprehension of the truth. Mm -hmm. I like the way you're reading a post-apocalyptic movie against like the allegory of Cain, because the way I understood uh, Plato's critique was that well, the philosophers know the truth, right? Mm -hmm. But then science was like a sister of philosophy. Mm -hmm. But post-apocalyptic fiction is all about not trusting science because this is yeah. what science did to us, and especially in this bird box, science depends on sense data mm -hmm. and and you know vision as one of our biggest organ for sense data, then you're covering that up. Because mm -hmm. science has misled us. It's given us this toxic environment in which birds and fish and bees are dying and we won't yeah. have proper oxygen to breathe. 
but then you're reading in post-apocalyptic fiction the distrust science against mm -hmm. like with, along with the allegory of the cave which is you know like if you could, you could argue that science is an option of philosophy yeah also so in this movie we're being judged for our over reliance on sight I mean, yeah. that's what Charlie says, right? He's mm -hmm. like, there's all these stories of all these different places. He's like, all these stories of all these different kinds of things that are categorized as demons or avenging angels or um, different characters in various cultures who are seen as um, people who, creatures that are balancers of judgment. And they often appear as really scary monsters. So we're being judged in this. I mean, that's, that could be another way of like, like you, what you're saying, like we're being judged for our reliance on science, yeah. our reliance on science. Well, all post-apocalyptic fiction is about how the world is, you know how we have this popular saying that everything's going to be better in the future, like it's something we believe is hope, right. but post-apocalyptic fiction is like everything's not going to be better yeah, in the future, right. everything's going to be way it's worse here in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, <coughs> against this idea of hope, which is always a way to keep people calm. Don't right. panic, mm -hmm. things will get better, everything's gonna work out. And the millennials are like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Like that's a false false statement mm -hmm. kind of thing for them. So good job. Good, I'm glad Very you liked it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no problem. Thank you. Especially like where after I saw it and having the interpretation, it makes it like my, you know. I have to see it now. A little better in my mind now that like they're making these connections. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. So what was the, descri the uh, description? The oh, the movie description is, when a mysterious force decimates the population, only one thing is certain. If you see it, you die. The survivors must now avoid coming face to face with an entity that takes the form of their worst fears. Searching for hope and a new beginning, a woman and her children embark on a dangerous journey through the woods and down a river to find the one place that may offer sanctuary. To make it, they'll have to cover their eyes from the evil that chases them and complete the trip blindfolded. That's yeah. That's interesting that they would put that it's their greatest fear. I just don't. Um, I don't think so. Like so, there's a lot of like other interpretations you could push on that. So, for example, uh, Freud talks about. I know I didn't do a psychoanalytic reading, but. It's always kind of on my mind, but Freud talks about how, like, why is it that, like, when you get what you want, you're often disappointed. Like, you're like, man, it was a hard day. I can't wait to have that beer. I'm going to go home and crack that beer. Or I'm going to go to my favorite pizza place, get that pizza I love or that yeah. sandwich I love. And then you take a bite of it and you're just kind of, like, underwhelmed. It's not the form. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, maybe another bite. Maybe it's the second bite or maybe it's just the experience or, you know, whatever. Or do they have a different cook or, you know, all these things go through your head, but it definitely keeps you chewing. But uh, Freud says that the model of pleasure as g getting what you want is not where the joy comes from. It's the barriers in the way. So the barriers that you ch the challenges you face and the things you face on the way to getting what you want is where pleasure comes from. It's not from the actual taking in of the thing. That you want. It's the challenge of getting it is the source of pleasure. So with that in mind, it's like it could be a, the exactly what you want out of life could cause someone to commit suicide. Well, like Lydia, Douglas's wife, sees her mother. Yeah. She climbs into a burning car. Yeah, she said she saw her mother. So it's like the the kind of the things that you want out of life that keep you going every day are not if you got them that would like end it. You know. So like there's a, you know there's this great book Freud Freud was a notorious um, really rude and horrible atheist making fun of people with religious beliefs, calling them stupid. He was not a really smart person. He just really, something in his life made him very anti-religious. But he had a correspondent who tried to push back on this and said, maybe there's something there about faith. And so he wrote a book about religion, which is in English called The Future of an Illusion. It gives you the sense of his feelings on religion. Um, the Future of an Illusion. But in it, he said there is this kind of like great oceanic feeling or this totalizing feeling that as people get older, they feel very relaxed knowing they're going to be part of this wholeness that they are apart from. And so he starts to think about, you know, what is that? What is that wholeness? And so he comes up with this idea of, well, the reason that we continue our life is because we have this sort of, um, this totalizing feeling. But if we, ha ever, if we ever had that feeling, if we ever got it, we work towards it. But if we got it, we would just stop. Like we would cease to live. And he called it the death drive, right? So the death drive, ironically named... Um, keeps it, he was like, you know, liked all these big Hollywood kind of names and stuff, you know, <laughs> you know um, 
all this stuff. But uh, the idea of that is that if you were to succumb to the great oceanic feeling and not see it as like a goal you have to work for and struggle, that's what keeps you alive. That's what keeps you chewing, that's what keeps you, eating, that's what keeps you meeting people, that's what gets you up out of bed. This is the idea that one day I'm going to be whole. And we all kind of, regardless of religion, we all kind of think, oh, I'll get to see my grandparents again, and my mother and father, and we'll all be together. People talk like this. We'll all know things. We'll all, yeah, we'll all be together, and everything will be cool, just chill. But you're not really, you know, people's conception of the afterlife, you're not really doing anything. Like, that would be horrible, right? Nobody's waiting in line for a taco in heaven. Like, no one talks about this. Um, nobody's Our getting the car. Talks about it. Yeah, nobody's getting the car fixed. You know, it's like there's just a nothing. So I think that could be it too. I mean, it's weird that they would say it's their greatest fear, but maybe well, yeah. the greatest fear would be perfection. Would be a great, yeah. a great fear. And that's that a Burkean connection too. Yeah, because it's a Burkean connection too. Because Burke says human beings are rotten with perfection, in his definition of man. And what does he mean by that? Well, that we um, are imperfect beings, and we want to strive to be perfect. But maybe something about that striving defines us as human. It's the action. It's the action. Still, I mean, this is the yeah. thing, like you said, in the um, the philosopher's perfection is stillness. Like if you see, like you, if it's still, it's dead. Yeah. We are always already moving. There's mm -hmm. never not a. I mean, if you are, then you can't be still. Yeah. But if you're still, you end it. So like that's another thing too. Like maybe the perfect. There's they're seeing perfection, then then they have to end it because they have to be still. Yeah. Well, there's nothing more to say, nothing more to do, nothing more to think. That's stillness. Yeah. Because there's no room for change and growth. Right. You're done. Yeah. I mean, it's you can say that you're done. Yeah. There's no more. There's no more. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like the refining of everything you thought you wanted might be enough for people to kill themselves. Mark Twain, can I tell you about the thing about this? Sure. It says in yeah. Letters from the Earth. I think I've probably told you this before, but um, one of the things he laughs about in Letters from the Earth, which is a, which is a story based on... Um, uh, Lucifer's letters back to his friends Gabriel and um, uh, uh, the other one, what's the other one? Gabriel and the guy with the sword. Gabriel and the sword. Whatever. His two friends, the angels. Mm -hmm. And Lucifer's been confined to Earth for like a million years, which the angel is like a week and a half, right? But it's still like he's on Earth and it's like ridiculous. He's making fun of humans. And one of the things he says is that everybody hates going to church, right? They hate the singing, they hate the sitting, they hate the still, like being still. He's like, and yet, Christians imagine that heaven is a long-term church service. And that's where you want to go. That's where you want to go. You're going to be sitting in a pew for eternity. Yeah, but you see, it's that. It's that. There until yeah. you totally embrace the stillness. Yeah. I know. You know, like a lot of Catholic belief is about the purgatory, where you're still like working on your right, sins. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that might not, be a better place. Yeah, you're not ready for heaven. Until I think there's he's stuff to do. I think he's really making fun of Protestants, <laughs> but yeah, ah, but yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they both have the same sort of perfect. Like nobody, very few people are like, you know, it's really awesome sitting in a pew for three hours while somebody who doesn't know about things yells at me. Yeah, it yells at you how bad you are. Yeah, how terrible, how much you hate love. But uh, I really think the power of the mind is being emphasized. Uh, Forget about other uh, capacities that we have. The power of the mind, and uh, when you were talking, you used the word illusions. And yeah. so, suddenly I remembered uh, one of the best books I've ever read is by Richard Bach, and it's called Illusions. Yeah. And there it talks about how, I mean, it sounds like cliche, but you, the mind has with the mind, you can build, you can destroy, you can do anything you want, and and the power is inside of you, inside you as a as a human being. Don't ask God or others to give you that power because you have it. Yeah. And so anyway, I was thinking. About no, that. it's good. And now we talk about like brain science. We don't talk about mind science. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we see the the brain is this like really wet computer. That has chemicals that move around right. in it, and that's like, that's how we're going to solve our political problems. Is like, you put like a Republican and a Democrat in an MRI, and you show them a video of Ronald Reagan, and this part of their brain lights up in this one. And they're like, and okay, we so got it. We used to talk about memory, which is like a map of places yeah. in your mind mm -hmm. where where you would shop for arguments. Yeah, right. So it's like it's like a a mind for me brings up this sort of creative capacity that you're right is celebrates and lets people know that humans have the power to create the world in which they live to a very 
broad extent, but in our current regime, it's all about the limits of a very wet, you know, chemically influenced computer. Um, and that's really what people talk about. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's really what it is. Bags of mostly water that the chemical goes off in your brain and you're like suddenly angry at somebody. Like no motive, no interpretation. Um, and that's kind of the prevailing model. And so that's why people walk around and they say, I'm just not wired to accept that. I'm not wired to, to read books or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I guess if we had this, if we, if we spent as much time on mind <coughs> as we do brain, maybe we would have a much more liberatory capacity to say, hey, we could change the narrative here. We really could change the narrative here. But then, of course, you know, then, you know, interpretation versus interpretation, you still have big walls and big hurdles. Or the focus on philosophy and understanding rather right? yeah. than knowledge. Yeah, but even, even if you eliminate all that kind of scientific grounding for it, there's still people who would flip out if you said we don't need a Congress or we don't need a president. People would flip out if you made this argument it's seriously. Structure. Yeah, we don't need that. Because they're used to that. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need a, we don't, we need a new constitution. People would think you were like a horrible, yeah, horrible. Sure. <laughs> I mean, New York State is rejected at all. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. And then, 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 and Challenges. Yeah. And somebody got hurt or something. Lots of people got hurt. Driving. Oh, after the movie? I'm sorry, yeah, I don't know. Know. There's some very funny memes <laughs> though out there. Bird box memes you should look, they're really yeah, funny. Bird box memes are but watch the movie and see. Yeah, of course.